welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George. Yeah, today I'm going to take advantage of what I have available. Uh, I just don't happen to have the luxury of a bunch of stuff that we normally would have. So we're going to put together a couple of mashes and you'll see just how easy it really is. Well, I figured I would take advantage of all the stuff I got kind of left over, you know, from the last season. Um, only because right about now um, is the is sort of like the perfect time of year here where we're located because it's going to be an average of about 75 to 80 degrees for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so therefore, I don't have to try to control my environment. Whereas here in the middle of the summertime, I'll have to run air conditioners. I mean, a lot of other things have to take place. And of course, during the winter, I got to keep the shop warm. So. Uh, now is a perfect opportunity because I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So uh, right now we're at about 78 degrees in here, and you know that's re relatively comfortable, and it should maintain that for quite a while. So I'm gonna take advantage of the opportunity that I have, and plus I just I just need some mash to to be to go forward. Oh, that's still hot. So here's what I've got going on. Um, I've got my fermenters ready, um, and I've got this big kettle that I use, uh, this is one of the stills, and I just take advantage of its availability to prepare the water for the mash, yes, because uh, that is one way of sanitizing the water itself, uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I've got my dry malt extract, what I have left of that, uh, and this stuff is, I've got it in a double, a double bag, the bag it came in, plus I've got two trash bags around it because this stuff is so dry, if you just leave it sit out, it'll attract any of the moisture in the air. It'll start to crystallize. So you need to keep that stuff pretty dry. Uh, I usually leave it in a sealed drum in two bags uh, in order to prevent it from crystallizing. Uh, so we're going to use that. Of course, I also have my corn syrup. So I've got three bottles of that because I'm going to do three large fermenters. Um, so one per, and then I've got some additional sugar. Uh, and I'll use some sugar. Now, this is th there is no rhyme or reason for this, what you'd call quote unquote recipe. Uh, this is really a mixture, uh, but it's one that I've used on several occasions. Um, the only thing that I'll be short is I'll be short the amount of dry malt extract because I only have so much left over. So it will be a Frankenstein model of uh, something that we've done in the past. Now, um, remember, my hydrometer, I, I'm not going to give you, well, I mean, there, it would make no sense for me to say, well, you use two pounds of this and then one pound of that and then one bottle of this, because I'm not really positive yet what I have here. I'm going to have to split this between three, uh, and I'll make up the rest of my gravity points by using my hydrometer. Remember, we talk about that over and over and over again about use your hydrometer. It's the only way to tell how much fermentable sugars you have in your mash when you're ready to pitch yeast. And we'll show you how we do that. Uh, so, uh, and we talked about, yes, yesterday I came out here, and oh, by the way, thanks to Norm. Norm, uh, you kind of got me motivated again. I know I've been on the sidelines for a couple of weeks. I've got some home projects and things going on, but Norm, you got me motivated, my friend, and I appreciate that. Um, what I did was I filled this up to about here, probably about 25 gallons of water, and I did that yesterday. And I heated that up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which was, oh, what, 84 degrees, 82, 84 degrees Celsius. And I allowed that to set for several hours. And the reason I did that was, first of all, one is I had the opportunity and I had the availability and just had the luxury of being able to do that, number one. Uh, but number two is, is that I want to sanitize the water. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Of course, there are other methods as well. Um, we have Camden tablets is another method. Uh, one Camden tablet per gallon, if you crush it up uh, and mix it in there, and you just let it set. And you always do this 24 hours prior to doing anything else to your waters. Uh, and that allows, because this will turn into a, a gas, uh, and then that gas will start to escape, and you need to allow that to escape out of the water uh, it does a really good job of uh, displacing some chlorine, um, and it also will kill any of those beasties that are kind of floating around and just kind of, you know, residual 
bacteria that are in your water. It's, it's a real good sanitizer. Uh, if you're trying to use it as a sanitation um, mixture, uh, it takes like 10 to 15 Camden tablets per gallon, and you can use that as you would any other product to sanitize. Remember, please stay away from chlorine, Clorox bleach, you know, things like that, because they, they do, that, that stuff is just real difficult to deal with because it leaves a film, uh, especially Clorox. Um, uh, now, we also have Star Sand. Uh, you, you know about Star Sand. We use Star Sand all the time because we spray all of our equipment, we spray all of our utensils with it. Uh, it's a non contact sanitizer. Uh, this stuff is good. Look, one ounce per five gallons. That's why this one bottle has so far lasted me probably nine months. Uh, and I'm still not, what, I'm still haven't gone halfway through this bottle yet. It's a really good stuff. It's a contact sanitizer. You spray it on. just a, You can spray it, shake it, and use it. Um, we're going to mix up some right now. Now, it's one ounce per gallon, and it's kind of hard. I'm only going to make a small spray bottle because... Once you mix this stuff, if you leave it sealed, it will remain effective. Um, if you leave it unsealed, like in an open bucket, it's going to do just like Camden tablets. It's going to escape on its own, so it's going to become non-effective. So we leave it in a sealed container. I love using a spray bottle because it's so easy. It's so easy to take advantage of and use. And... So, you know, we say an ounce per five gallons. How much is that in this? Not a whole lot. Uh, so I kind of eyeball it, you know. It comes with this. I'm going to put in less than a quarter of an ounce. And here's my recommendation for you. If you're ever going to do this, is, of course, always put the water in first and then add your star sand. Uh, if you go backwards and add the star sand first, uh, it is so active that when you add water, it'll foam up, and put, you'll wind up with a big bottle of foam. So, that's it. My star sand is ready, ready for use. Put that on mist. It'll go to mist here in a second. No, it won't. And we use that to spray. We use this to spray the inside of the fermenters. That's all it takes. And I'll go ahead and spray these other ones while I'm here. We'll be back shortly. Okay, I'm going to skip the use of uh, Camden tablets because I've I've already boiled. Well, I've brought it up to just short of a boil. Anything above. Was it 162 degrees or so? Kills anything that's living, any kind of organism that's living in uh, in your water. So since I've done all of that, and then I came back out this morning, I heated it back up to 120 degrees, and my 120 degree mark is what about a little over about 50 degrees Celsius. And the reason I heated it up to that level is because I want to take advantage of the thermal energy, the heat, uh, when it comes to dissolving sugars. Now, I don't have any problem at all with using the water with dry malt extract because it will dissolve immediately because it is so dry. Uh, but once I start adding my corn syrup, and if I have to add any sugars, you know how granulated sugar will really liquefy in warm water as opposed to cold water. You know, in cold water, it just takes forever. Uh, so I don't have any need to use any candid tablets. Could I? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I sure could. Uh, it's for a for an extra step of uh, safety and security and concern. Yeah, I sure could. But uh, I have found that it's not necessary once I've used star sand or heated the water up. So I'm just about ready to go. And here's what I have. Uh, I need to show you this because this used to be a 50-pound bag, 25 kilograms. And I bought, I get these on Amazon. I just, you just go to Amazon and type in dry malt extract, um, DME. And you can also get LME, liquid malt extract. 
but I like working with dry malt extract because to me it's just a lot easier. Uh, there are some there are some disadvantages, I would think. Yeah, yeah, because you do have to double wrap it and you have to seal it up and when you put it away. Uh, this is made by a company called Brie, and Brie is a common uh, company, a really well-known company that produces grains and a lot of other products for brewing and distilling, uh, but Brie makes this dry malt extract, and they just atomize. They go through the process of using two-row barley um, and other grains and adjuncts uh, they already prepare the wart and then they spray it and atomize it which removes all of the water and it makes it a dry powder so it's like dehydrated um, it's something like dehydrated milk or something it has all the same properties of what it was original originally but all the water's been removed so it makes it a little bit easier to ship and store and use and utilize so I'm gonna cut this bag off across here because I only have probably about now uh, maybe 20 pounds of that left and uh, normally I'll use three six probably six six or seven pounds in a six gallon fermenter uh, that's what I would attempt to use uh, but of course I've always got the hydrometer on standby um, produces a really good you've seen it in the past we ran it through the still um, uh, again uh, just by the fact that this is all I've got left uh, goes to show you how often I have used that. Uh, just like anybody. There, I wanted to give you a look at that on the inside. You'll see how dry that is. It's like a powder. Um, and this is the light dry malt extract. And, uh, mm, yeah, it's really sweet and full of a lot of flavor. Now, if I left this sit open for an hour or two, uh, this would develop a crust across the top because it would start to absorb all the moisture that's in the air surrounding it. So now that I got it open, it's time to use it. Mm. It's really, of course, really, really sticky. This is going to be great because I know there are guys out there going to go, see, I knew there was an easy way to do that. And there really is. Um, you know, but, but I would say, I would caution you. If you're just sitting in the shop or the house or somewhere and you're like, well, I wonder if I throw a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little, um, look into the background and maybe a little bit of the, you know, what's, you caught me. See, I do still like to measure. So I've got almost a pound in this big scooper. So what I'll do is I'll start to separate and I'll put a scoop in each one of these all the way through until I run out and then I'll try to multiply that up and determine how many pounds I have at each one. It kind of gives me a data point because I can start doing some math and you know what I mean. I, I'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah, you'll see I got my brush out and what I'm trying to do is brush off the stuff that I have uh, overspilled and missed. Uh, and you'll notice that when you try to brush it, it's just, it's stuck. This is a, uh, this is kind of what it looks like in the end after using the scoop. And the scoop wasn't wet. It's just, it's, drawn in all that look at that it's drawn in all that moisture uh so it's become it's starting to form that uh that crust i was telling you about uh, we can take advantage of that and try to get it off of there but we're only going to get so much because that stuff look at that that's so that is the uh not the downfalls, but that's just the challenges of using dry malt extract is that it just, it clumps up when it gets, comes in contact with the air uh, and of course any liquid. Well, it's time to take it ne the next step. Yeah, I only want to add enough water to liquefy this um, and to do two things. One is I'll use this big paddle to start to stir it uh, and then I'll use my whisk to really beat it up really good but uh, it's gonna it'll take a little bit of effort because this stuff likes to clump up on you and I've got to do that to all three of these <clears throat> 
Well, my next step is to add uh, one bottle of this, and this is actually 32 fluid ounces or 946 milliliters. Um, and I'll add one of these to each one of these fermenters. Now, what's really interesting about this is this has no fructose. It's a no fructose syrup, which fructose is the most complex uh, of the sugar chains. Uh, and remember, glucose is your lowest hanging fruit. Your yeast love that. So having no fructose, Fructose, yeah, uh, makes this really, really advantageous, and it's got and one of the other additives is a little bit of vanilla. So uh, I add this for the to increase the, the gravity um, in having fermentable sugars, but also for the flavor profile that it imparts. And it only takes one. Could you put two in there? Absolutely. Now I managed to re I managed to remove uh, enough to test with my hydrometer, and right now I'm floating, um, and it's 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 kind of challenging because this stuff does foam, and it takes a long time not a long time it takes an yeah a pretty long time for it to all settle out to where you have just liquid, so uh, that's because I've got a lot of oxygen introduced from all the stirring. Uh, but I can see that my 1.100 is floating above the foam, so I can just kind of correlate that, and I'm, I'm probably floating it maybe 17% potential alcohol by volume, or uh, what would that be like 1.25, uh, which is, of course, we know that that's a high gravity. That's just like super high. Uh, it's way too high for what we want to do. We always want to be what below what? Somewhere around 1.090. And the reason for that is, is that when you have too much fermentable sugars, your yeast run out of water because they're converting the available water into alcohol. Uh, and then that replaces uh, the water there. And water is the elixir of life. And your yeast need water in order to do their thing. Uh, so you always have to have enough water left behind. That's why we keep our gravity a little on the lower side of the scale. In this one, I'm okay with 1.080. Um, you know, we talk about this often. Um, a lot of distilleries are happy if they're anywhere between 8 and 11% potential alcohol by volume. But that's What that does really is it guarantees a full fermentation uh, without any interruptions or hiccups. Uh, but once you get above that, there's always that chance that, uh, you, yep, you've just you've eaten up all the sugars and you've produced enough alcohol to where your environment is inhospitable and the yeast just give up. So it doesn't ferment all the way down. Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, now knowing that it's what it is, um, I've done a little bit of gazintas, um, and based on the amount of volume I have in the fermenter and the volume of water that I have to add to it now, that'll bring that gravity down to what I'm looking for, right about 1.080. Uh, so I'm happy with that. That's all I've got to do now is just continue to add water to these. Um, and then I'll have to set them up to let them cool down because they're a little bit too hot right now. Uh, I like to pitch yeast below 90 degrees. Anything under 100 degrees Fahrenheit is fine. Um, I like to get it below 90, it just kind of gives it that warm blanket of that environment so that they can propagate correctly. Um, so I'll just let them set up on the shelf and I'll put a fan in front of them. And the benefit of having glass, uh, which I like to use, it's not absolutely necessary. I like to use glass because I get to see what's going on inside as those yeasts start to eat. And you'll start to see the swirls and the bubbles and uh, the dysfunction of what's happening inside your fermenter, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, and it's really, really amazing. It's just one of those things, uh, those creations of nature that are just visible if you give yourself the opportunity to see that. Whereas in a bucket or in some other fermenters, it's, it's an invisible process. You just know it's happening. So, all right, now all I got to do is I'll put these up on the counter. Again, yeah, have them cool down. Once they get cool, uh, I'll add my yeast. And uh, I'll use that angel. Uh, you remember from previous videos we discussed that. Uh, I started, the, I'm really, really moving in towards that. That angel yeast is pretty good stuff. Uh, with the angel yeast, I always add 
about a half a tablespoon of distiller's active dry yeast. Um, just can't hurt. So that seems to work out well for me for that blend of angel yeast and distiller's active dry yeast. Um, and I use a full heaping tablespoon of the angel yeast. So um, that kind of brings this to a close. These things will ferment on their own for the next seven to 10 days. Um, well, when they're done, they're done. Uh, all we've got to do is continue to track the gravity and or the activity in the, our airlocks. Uh, and at some point in time, we'll transfer these into a secondary and we'll allow them to set and clarify before we, yep, distill it. Happy distilling.